appreciate very much Dr. Lindsay for allowing this event to be held here. We are very grateful. Also, present with us is a representative from Wheaton College. Elizabeth was herself a graduate of Wheaton College, and we've had a lot of connections with them. One of the Board of Trustee members from Wheaton College, Jerry Bennett, is here. Jerry, would you stand wherever you are? I don't see Jerry Bennett. Oh, yeah, at the very back. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. He's there to recognize us. We're very happy to have him here. Uh, I will suggest that when we sing, uh, we understand that not everybody has hymn books. Let me see. Do most of you folks have hymn books, or do most of you not have hymn books? How many hymn books are there? Some. All right. We will sing the first and the last verse of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Before we sing, however, my brother Jim Howard, Reverend Jim Howard, who is himself a pastor in Montana, he will lead us in opening prayer. Will you stand with me, please, as we pray together? Father, thank you today that the Lord Jesus, your Son, is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Thank you that he is our great High Priest who has full understanding of our feelings, our weakness, and has invited us to come boldly to the throne of grace for help in our times of need. Thank you that because of Christ's resurrection, we know that we who have trusted in him Look forward to that new life with him. And as we gather in this memorial service today, we do so with confidence that death has been swallowed up in victory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Remain standing, please, as we sing together. Those of you who have him will see. be seated. I have not had the privilege of meeting Helen Hammond. Is Helen here? Yes, please come. And Helen Hammond will be singing for us. Uh, she'll be accompanied by Kia, who is one who has lived and helped with the, the Grens quite a bit. And then from here on in, the rest of the program will be held as late, uh, listed in the program. Jim, did you? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Of 
God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair, though done with care, God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shows. My sister Elizabeth, or as the family called her, Betty, was eight years older than I, so that when she was a teenager, I was still a small boy. I point this out simply to emphasize an oddity, namely that she and I had an extraordinary relationship from the start. Somehow, even in the midst of the family hurly-burly, we were six children which would arise amid the uproarious laughter that often marked the household. Somehow, no matter what was going on, Betty and I could always catch each other's eye in an exchange which said, I know exactly what you are thinking and how you're feeling right now. She and I had virtually identical sensibilities. We, the small boy and the young woman, laughed at the same things and would also shed tears over the same things. We loved the same hymns and the same English prose. This touches on something about Betty that her public 
perhaps never had the chance to see, the thousands of people who became aware of her when her husband, Jim Elliott, was killed in Ecuador, and then, as the years went by, those who were affected by her writings and speeches, these people might see her as a sort of heroic, almost Olympian figure. And that is not entirely a wrong impression. She was all of that, certainly. I think our parents were always a bit awed by her, even before she became well known. But she had an extraordinary capacity for laughter. She would laugh loudly and helplessly, for example, over our father's tales of the Pratt Falls that seemed to bedevil his footsteps, and at our oldest brother, Phil, who was an irrepressible mimic, especially of Scottish or Norwegian or Philadelphia accents. She laughed at sheer wit, certain writers like Joyce Grenfell and Cornelia Otis Skinner. She laughed at radio comedians, and she laughed at the general drollery that marked our family life. I should add here that she herself was an irrepressible mimic, regaling us all with her imitations of remarks that she might hear at the grocers or on the street or wherever people gathered. She especially liked regional accents, the local South Jersey twang or the Yankee Argo that we heard every summer in Franconia, New Hampshire. Over the years, she came increasingly to look to me to tell her what to read. While she was still in Ecuador after Jim's death, I'd send her books by Kierkegaard, or Paul Tillich, Dostoevsky, John Updike, Francois Sagan, and so forth. And as time went on, the works of Cardinal Newman and the Russian Orthodox theologians Alexander Schmemann and Kalistas Ware. She also turned more and more to the works of the saints and medieval mystics. Of the spiritual writers from the evangelical wing of Protestantism, I would guess that Amy Carmichael would be very near the top of her list. Interestingly enough, she came gradually and I would say inexorably to find rest for her soul in the Eucharistic liturgy of the ancient church. I think that perhaps our father's manifest love for what he called the great hymns of the church had instilled in her, as in me, an appreciation of the dignity, weight, and majesty of forms of worship that have been hallowed by long usage. In 1956, she became the focus of attention in the media. Life and Time magazines had articles about her and followed her entry with her small daughter, Valerie, into the Alka tribe in 1958. She was, in this connection, flown to New York and found herself swept into that world of news and publishing. She found that world vastly intriguing and, in some sense, sympathetic. <clears throat> the non-religious publishers and photographers found themselves bemused by this woman straight from the jungle and the world of Christian missions, so manifestly civilized and at ease among them. Her aplomb pleased and I think startled them somewhat. She knew how to hold her fork. <laughs> These fragmentary recollections may perhaps help to augment the picture of Elizabeth that some here today may have formed, either through personal acquaintance or friendship or through her writings and talks. Thank you. I have a happy memory of a little lean-to in the balsam woods along Pond Brook below the old family cottage in Franconia, New Hampshire, a scene which our family members can well picture. My big sister Betty, as we called her, had taken me camping overnight along the mountain stream. I was about seven. It was just one of those instances of her taking an interest 
in her little brother and helping me open my eyes to the beauties of the world around me. Forward about six years, sacks of coffee beans stacked on the wharf around us in the harbor at Hoboken, New Jersey, our father leading us as a family singing, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, as the ship, the SS Santa Maria, slowly separated from the dock. Waving from the rail of the ship was my sister on her first voyage to Ecuador as a missionary. The other day, I sat over coffee with a young man from the congregation of the Alliance Church we serve in Helena, Montana. He spoke of Elizabeth and how her writings have had such a profound impact for good in his wife's life over the years. This is just one example of countless that my wife and I have heard from our Montana friends. Joyce and I have been recipients of Betty's personal notes of comfort and encouragement throughout the years. I have in my hand a note dated Hamilton, Massachusetts, September 14, 1981. My wife Joyce and I had just accepted a call to serve a church in a new location. And this note, written in Betty's beautiful handwriting, which I have kept in my files along with others, says in part, Dear Jim and Joyce, so glad to hear of your decision, taken, I'm sure, much more by faith than by sight. So many unknowns, so many possibilities, risks, fears, yet all of them the goods to trust in him who knows the end from the beginning. Much love, Betty. As I think of my sister today, the words of Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 come to my mind. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. I'd like to ask you to stand together again, if you will. We're going to sing as a congregation that great hymn of Charles Wesley. For those of you who have a hymn book. Perhaps you'd like to just share around as well as you can with your neighbors, number 203, and we will sing together just the first stanza. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood, amazing love? How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Just the first stanza together, let's sing.
And I have a request from Lars Gren that we don't stop right there. So we won't stop right there. And Lars, shall we sing it all the way through? I hear lots of yeses. So here we go, the second stanza, if you will. He left his father's throne above. be seated.
both of the numbers that Helen sang are the one, probably two of the favorites of Elizabeth and 
whenever we had a gathering at the house or at the uh, sometime annual Christmas tea, we always sang, if I cannot tell, and also, well, both of them, and that was uh, her favorites. And having heard her speak many times, there were also favorite passages that she much often applied to her talks. And many of them, as you know, who have heard her uh, had the subject of suffering or loss. And uh, I want to read the Isaiah 43, a couple of chapters, a couple of verses. I won't go into chapters. And it says, when, <clears throat> when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not set you ablaze. I'm the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior. That was the verse that Jim referred to sailing to Ecuador. And when she landed in Guayaquil, that was the verse that came to her and uh, really kept her there. And it was also the verses that came to her mind when she heard that her husband Jim was missing. Well, I heard, often heard her in speaking, bringing these into the messages. And uh, Walter's going to have another one that meant a lot to her. The M.I.L., she called herself, the mother-in-law. She loved to tell crowds of people that Walt got to marry her daughter Val and Lars got the old lady. I told her, don't say that. You're not an old lady. And then she went, yet. One of these passages of scripture that would come up in a lot of her talks were about the fiery trial. Lars, it is kind of fitting that you and I would do the reading here, the lodger and the houseboy. But boy, did we make out all right. I teased her one time and said to her, I hope that I'm not part of the fiery ordeal, <laughs> marrying your daughter. And I'm probably the only one that she's ever just rolled her eyes and said, oh, Walt. But she lived it. The very two verses I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. This is from uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And that's what she's seeing. And with that, on all of those, on those three verses, or three sections, I can see her. And she used to illustrate it. And I'm sure that if some of you heard her speak on suffering and all, when she read that, she would say, it's like an assayer scale. And we put our troubles on this side and what God does to us and those troubles become like feathers. She had vivid illustrations and uh, I was thankful. You know, I always listen to her. People, some people you say, well, you've heard this before. And I always used to say that, well, yeah, you know, but there's always something new. She really could address the people, and I'm thankful. My sister and Elizabeth and I were just 13 months apart. I'm 13 months younger than she was. I've often joked about this and said that that made me realize that I was not a planned child. <laughs> As I've been thinking about her recently, one word from Scripture has been coming to mind. Revelation chapter, four, uh, chapter 14 verse 13, which says this, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Three specific things said about those who will die in the Lord. First of all, blessed or happy. That word in the Greek, which is translated blessed, is translatable as happy. And the second word is they rest from their labors. And then third, their deeds will follow them. First of all, they rest. They're blessed. They're happy. Elizabeth was a happy person. My brother Tom has already spoken about her sense of humor. She had a wonderful sense of humor. She would make the, la the, the, the family just crack up in laughter anytime she wanted to. She was very, very good at this. One of her particular gifts that she used so greatly later on in translating the New Testament into languages that were not known to us, one of her gifts was imitating other people. She was great at that. I remember we had a Sunday school teacher who had a terrible South Jersey accent. And we would come home Sunday noon, gather around the Sunday dinner table, and Elizabeth would start talking and imitating her Sunday school teacher. And the rest of us would just die with laughter. My mother always had a way of calming Betty down with that. Betty was maybe 8 or 10 or 12 years old when she was doing this, and Mother would say, she called her Bets. We always called her Betty, as you've noticed here. She said, now, Bets, just remember, she is a faithful soul. And so my mother's description of any of these Sunday school teachers was, they were a faithful soul. So Elizabeth was happy. 
She could tell hilarious stories. Many of you know that she had one reading that she would give over and over again to our delight. She had a story about a kindergarten teacher in England, and she would tell this story with an English accent and uh, went on and on, and of course, we just rolled around in laughter. So she was a very happy person, and we're thankful for that. So when we get together, we still do a lot of laughing as a family, and if you see any of our family here laughing together at a funeral, just remember, we're laughing because we thank the Lord for a sister who had a wonderful, wonderful sense of humor. And she would want us at her funeral to be laughing. We also read in this one verse, blessed are they, the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors. Elizabeth finally has rested. She was a hard, hard worker. She worked all her life, 88 years, that she poured out her life and herself for the Lord and for the family and for the people she loved. She always, she was not a restful kind of a person in that sense. She never took much time for herself to rest. But today, she rests from those labors. She was a hard worker. In college, she poured herself into Greek as a Greek major with a plan to move on and do translation work of the scriptures. She worked very hard, and she graduated with high honors. She was very good at mountain climbing. One of my brothers has mentioned uh, our climbing of the mountains in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. We spent a good bit of our summer almost every year for many, many years in our growing up years in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And we climbed those mountains. And she was a wonderful climber. She could outstrip many of us. And then years later, she trudged around in the jungles of Ecuador, carrying her daughter Valerie on her back or other things that she would do. And she was a hard, hard worker there too. She would just trudge on and on endlessly in the jungles. And then later, after Jim Elliott died and she came back to the States and she married a first time and then a second time, uh, she traveled a lot in the United States. Lars Gren, her husband, will tell you about the travels that they did everywhere, all around the United States and around the world. She became a very, very well-known speaker and writer, so people invited her to speak. And she worked very, very hard doing that kind of thing. But she, she has now rested in the arms of Jesus. When I was a very small child, and because Betty and I were within 13 months of each other in age, we would sometimes sit together on our mother's lap. And I shall never forget our mother singing to us in a rocking chair. My mother sat most of the time in a rocking chair. She would have Elizabeth and me both on her lap, and she would sing a great hymn, which I've never forgotten, safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love controlling, he, he, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm forgetting the words. Surely my soul shall rest. I remember that, safe in the arms of Jesus. And I like to think of Betty now. She's resting safely in the arms of Jesus. And then finally, their deeds will follow them. Elizabeth will continue to be well known for many, many years to come. Lars Grand will make sure of that. Lars will be handling her books and her writings, and those will continue. Her first book, of course, most of you, or many of you at least, have read it, and you know that it was a runaway bestseller, Through Gates of Splendor. She wrote that shortly after her first husband, Jim Elliott, died. And uh, that's hit the bestseller list for, year, for a long, long time. It was published by Harper and Rowe. Just this past week, 
Mark Taylor, who is the president of the Tyndale Publishing House, told me their experience with that book. While it was originally published by Harper and Row, 25 years later, in 1981, the Tyndale Publishing House got the rights to that book and published it again in a 25-year uh, edition. And Mark Taylor just told me last week that they have already sold 500,000 copies of that edition. And he had no idea how many hundreds of thousands, probably several million copies that were written before. Her deeds will follow her. She spoke and she wrote wonderfully well. One of the things she always spoke about in every message she ever gave, there was, a, there was an emphasis on the centrality of obedience. She came to be known as someone who would always talk about obedience. I shall never forget when the five men were killed in the jungles of Ecuador by the Waurani, or later previously known as the Alca Indians. I went immediately to Ecuador to be with my sister. I was at that time a missionary in Latin America. So I went immediately to Ecuador. I was with her. Jim Elliott had been my best friend. He was actually best man in my wedding. So it just seemed right that I should be there with my sister in memory of him. The media all over the US picked this up immediately. There's probably never been a missionary story that was picked up as quickly and as completely as the media did with this story. And there, the newspapers and television and radio and everything in magazines, everything else you could think of, descended on Ecuador to interview these people, to take pictures and so on. Life magazine, which as you all will remember, was certainly one of the leading, if not the leading, magazine of its time. Life magazine sent one of their very top photographers down to cover this story. His name was Cornell Kappa, one of the great photographers of that day. Cornell Kappa was there for, as I recall, close to a week, taking pictures, interviewing the five wives, reading their husbands, journals, and so on. And when Cornell Kappa got ready to go back to New York, to put together his story. And it was a wonderful story. As I recall, the next issue of Life magazine covered about 13 pages, something like that, with pictures and so on. He gathered the five widows together. I sat in to listen to that time. I wasn't one of the five. I, I sat off to the side, but I heard exactly what he said. He said this. He said, ladies, you have been very, very gracious to me. And I want to thank you for all your help. You've answered my questions. You've let me read your husband's letters. You've let me read their diaries. I have everything I need to know now, except one thing, to write a good article in Life magazine. He said, unless I can get this one thing, there's no way I can write an adequate article for Life magazine. And so the five widows obviously said, well, oh, Cornell, what is it you need to know? He said, for the life of me, I cannot understand why those men went there in the first place. He said, everybody knew that that tribe is a tribe of killers. Nobody ever went in to that tribe and came out alive. They never came out. Anybody who went into that territory died. Now, of course, it wasn't a broad territory because nobody had ever heard of them mostly. It was mostly oil prospectors, uh, people of that nature who might try to find something in the jungles, and they simply were killed. So he said, I cannot understand why those five men ever went there in the first place. And the five widows said, Cornell, we can answer that with one word. And he said, what's the word? And they all agreed, obedience. Obedience, that's the word. They said, our husbands obeyed the last command that Jesus Christ ever gave to his disciples. And that command was to go to all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone in the whole world. And the five widows said, our husbands went 
in obedience to that command. Of course we're sad that they died, but we are glad that they died in obedience to Jesus Christ. And those of you who have known Elizabeth Elliot and have heard her speak, you will know that on practically every message she ever gave, obedience came into it as part of that story. Another thing I could say about her, sitting right in front of me here, are various family members and various children. She always took time for the children, her grandchildren. She has great eight grandchildren through her daughter, Valerie, and uh, she would write little notes to them and the rest of us, our grandchildren. She would write little postcards encouraging them, thanking them, building them up as they were growing up. I'm very thankful for that. And we were all, in a sense, recipients of her love and care for other people. That's what she did. She died for other people. She, she preached for other people and everyone that she could. Yes, she was wonderfully used of God. And so today, as we gather here, we're thankful for her. And I see right on the front row here, her family and how they came to be. It's a most fascinating story to me. Elizabeth, as you know, had three husbands. There are three red roses, I understand, right here, representing the three husbands that she had. Jim Elliott, everybody knows that name. Her second husband was quite a few years later, Addison Leach, professor here at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, a wonderful man of God. Unfortunately, that marriage only lasted four months, uh, four, I'm sorry, four years, and then he was called home. And so at that time, Elizabeth asked Gordon-Conwell Seminary to assign two students to live with her, to take care of the yard and the house and all of the kind of thing that a man would do. She needed a couple of helpers, helpers. And so they found two students, one who was close to the age of the average seminary student, and another man who was more midlife and had come to seminary for a new career, as you say. And so the two, those two men moved into her home and encouraged and helped her. And they're sitting right here now in the front row. One is Lars Gren, who married her, and one is Walter Shepard, who married her daughter, Valerie. We thank God for that, wonderful people of God. And so it's now time to sing again. And if you have a hymn book, turn to number 415, and uh, we will sing that hymn together. 415, if you don't have a hymn book, try to squeeze next to somebody who does, and uh, we'll do the best we can to sing. And I would recommend that probably this hymn is not as well known as some others, but there's only two verses, so we'll do the best we can with these two verses. Thank you. Yes.
our Father's full giving is only begun. He fear has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power has no Now, Lars Bren will come again. Well, I want to thank Dave for uh, what he said. I just want to assure you folks that I don't have a book table out there or CD. I mean, I thought, I thought he was going to say, as Elizabeth often said, yeah, my husband will be out there at the book table. And I thought Dave was going to say, well, he'll be out there at the book table. <laughs> I, I, I didn't plan it, but it was, thank you very much. And uh, the only, thing, only other thing I can say is if some of you have not seen Elizabeth's website, which is uh, elizabethelliot.org. Uh, I do have some of her cards around. I didn't want to place them in, in programs of use, but should you want that, or if you can't remember elizabethelliot.org and how it spells, why, you can get one from me. And uh, seeing as the flowers are mentioned, of course, we had requested, uh, we have been involved with Christian Workers' Fellowship Fund for many years, so we had put that in there rather than flowers, but kind people that some of the organizations sent some, so it's more than I expected to have here. However, since the rose, roses were mentioned, uh, the florist in Gloucester, when I called up to get some uh, flowers for a funeral, I asked her if they had some long stem roses, and she, she said yes. And uh, I said, well, I have a funeral coming up, and I, my wife, I'd like, to have a, I'd like to have a rose. She said, yes, but how many roses do you, would you like to have? A bouquet, and how do you want it? No, I said, I just want one rose. <laughs> I think they had a hard time believing it, because I had thought what I really wanted was just a rose, and uh, of course, the casket is a little different from what you normally see. You normally have a swing door and all, and I thought if we did close it here, then I was going to have the rose on top. But then after a while, I thought, you know, it's not fair. Um, here I am, number three. So that's what I said. So I called her back and I said, give me three roses. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and she, she said, would you, would you like them? In the individual... Uh, wrapped and with some nice baby's breath, and that'll make a very nice arrangement. No, I said, we don't need the baby's breath. I said, just give me a stem of a rose and a flower on top, but be sure you pick up a good one. Anyway, so that's the story of the three roses. That wasn't in the program either. But, uh, you know, people, we have a book at home that's last words of, you know, famous people. And uh, I can't tell you the last words of, it, that, of Elizabeth, but uh, it was uh, in the early years of our marriage, we were still living at, in Hamilton at the time, a house that uh, we had prior to moving to the Cove and the house that Elizabeth and Addison Leach had. And one morning, I had, a, I had an office in the basement, and. One morning I came up and, uh, to discuss something with Elizabeth. So I opened with this sentence. I have a thought. And uh, she didn't get, give me a chance to finish. She said, well, hang on, hang on to it. It's in a strange place. 
And there were times when, uh, if some of you had been to speaking engagements, maybe you have, that, uh, you know, sometimes there was a break in calling the people together. I'd go up and tell a few stories. And what would happen, uh, often tacking on some oddball episode that we had from our daily living. So it was a good time. But on uh, Monday morning, why, uh, of this last week, now I can't believe that more than a week has gone by, then that was the worst of times, and yet it was one of the sweetest days for Elizabeth. And I wanted to just touch on that. And uh, I have Tia over here. And I told her, if I, if I, if I don't get through this, I'm going to say, come on, Tia. And she'll take care of it. But uh, Kia and I were with her at 1 a.m. when she suffered what appeared to be a massive stroke. And uh, shortly after, Anna, the second caregiver that we had for a short time, came in. And it was evident after this that uh, the time was uh, drawing to a close. And I called Valerie and told her about it, and we had decided beforehand that we weren't going to call the uh, rescue squad or anything like that. And later, Steve Price, who was our family doctor for about 20 years and is now living in Wales, uh, I thought about him, and I wanted to call him. And so I called him. And providentially, he had just come back from North Korea the day before. So I told him what had happened, and he confirmed that what we did is the best thing, and just to, to be with her. And we had put her into bed. She had, we had gotten her up, and so we put her down into bed. And then I called Valerie, and in the meantime, we were singing hymns to her, reading, reading uh scripture and uh, and just patting her and trying to keep her calm and, and, and she did, she calmed down and uh, so then Steve told me exactly what it was going to be like, so we began at one and over the next five hours we continued this reading and comforting Elizabeth with hands and songs and prayers with Valerie on a speakerphone with, with us and for some time and the granddaughter Elizabeth rang from England, and so she sang. I mean, it was almost like we were having a little gathering together. And uh, toward the end, I, I thought about a poem that Elizabeth often quoted. And I couldn't get the first line. And I thought about it, thought about it. I think the Lord just put it in my head all, all of a sudden. I told Kia, I said, I said, it's in heavenly love abiding. And of course, I couldn't know, I didn't know the rest of it, so Kia got on the computer and with these mar mar marvels of living in today, it took her about 30 seconds and we had the whole thing printed out. So we read this, read that to her, and uh, about an hour later or so, there was just that quickening and a weakening breath. I read the poem again. Elizabeth opened her blue eyes once more and then just closed them. I thought there was a slight smile. And she became very still. I placed my hands on her lips and checked for a pulse and all. And I just said to Key and Anna, I said, I believe she has left us. And from that moment on, it was the sweetest of times for Elizabeth. 6.15 on Monday morning, the 15th. So it was an interesting five hours. And one of the prayers that I always had was that if I was to outlive her, 
that I would be there at the end. I didn't want to come in and see someone gone. So I'm thankful for that. And if somebody had a time clock, that it would run, they would have rung the bell on me for a while now. So where is this last little thing? Yeah, in, in, in case you don't, in case you only read the front of a bulletin and not the back, I just thought I'd go through this. And this is what we read. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear, and, such, and safe is such confiding, for nothing changes here. The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and can I be dismayed? Wherever he may guide me, no want shall turn me back, my shepherd is beside me and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waking, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he's taken, and I will walk with him. Green pastures are before me, which yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me, but dark clouds have been. I hope I cannot measure my path to life is free. My Savior has my treasure. And he will walk with me, owned by Anna Waring. And so it was the worst of days and yet the best and sweetest of days. Will you all rise for the closing prayer? And following the closing prayer, as Dan McKinley will be playing postlude, and we're so grateful to him for his time here, will you please remain standing as the families will be ushered out first, and then you all are invited to the graveside ceremony, which will take place uh, at the Hamilton Cemetery following which everyone is invited also to Gordon Conwell Seminary where dinner will be served there. Don't hesitate as far as coming to the lunch and all. We had, uh, I just know a, a good friend who spent all night and she's made 26 dozen chocolate chip cookies. So, and there's food and all, but anyway, I wanted to let you know, so maybe, you know, for you chocolate lovers and cookie lovers, that's, that's on the docket over there. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, it has been good to be here in your presence. We thank you for the memory of one of your wonderful servants who served you so faithfully and so long. We're grateful that she is now with you, rejoicing with you in the joy which has characterized her life and now in her death. We thank you, we praise you, we ask your continued blessing on each one here. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>